So, um, as I was preparing for today, um, I want to really talk about, you know, how do we define things like systemic racism and implicit bias and things like that. And I came across um, something in the news recently where Princeton University has um, really undertaken some efforts to deal with systemic racism on their campus. And they have basically admitted that, hey, we, we do have systemic racism here. And there are some things that we can do to address it. Um, my one, qu one question kind of broadly is, how important is it to, one, admit that there is systemic racism? And then secondly, how do you recognize it? How is it defined? How can we help people understand what it means when someone says or uses the, that phrase systemic racism? Whoever wants to start. Uh, Patricia, you were nodding. Let me go ahead and start with you. Yeah, you know, I think it is important to acknowledge it. One of the things I always say is the inherent challenge in diversity is that it's very difficult to understand someone else's reality that's not your own because it's not yours. And, and so I think America woke up when we watched, um, you know, the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, you know, that eight minutes and 46 seconds caused a real shift to occur in this country in a way that I haven't seen in the 44 years I've been doing this work. I hope we can sustain it. Um, I think for me, systemic racism, having worked at several universities and public and private sector, um, is, is, is definitely in line with what Patricia was talking about. But I think it also occurs when barriers to for success for people of color and women become part of the very fabric of the institution. And, and if we don't recognize or try to dismantle them, then we have systemic racism. And I think that all too often we forget that many institutions and organizations were never designed to have people of color there. They never anticipated people of color participating in the programs, attending the universities, and then so many of the practices and, 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 and policies um, that we have in place really don't allow us to have full citizenship in the organization, full citizenship on the campus, or full participation in the institution. And so that's when you recognize that, that when those barriers become part of the fabric of the institution, you have systemic racism. Right, absolutely. And so Daryl, you know, you're, you're the first chief diversity officer, I believe for NKU, is that correct? That's tell, correct. Tell me, um, tell me why did NKU decide that this was the time to bring in someone to be a chief diversity officer? And, and so what do you see as, as your role there in terms of um, educating the university community, um, bringing diversity to NKU? Um, how do you see that role kind of evolving? Well, uh, that's a great question. And um, that was a question I asked when I interviewed. <laughs> what do you want from this position? What does this look like? And quite frankly, um, Northern Kentucky University has amazing leadership in Ashish Vaidya, our president. And it was, his, it was his vision to really dismantle systemic racism at the institution, but to also to create opportunity and new pathways because he wants the university to be student ready. When we talk about being student ready, we're not talking about being white student ready. We're not talking about being, you know, international student ready. We're talking about being student ready, and that means being inclusive of all peoples and what does that look like? And when you know that you wanna be student ready, there's gonna be barriers and opportunities. And so my role is to not only make it student ready, for, um, make it ready for students, but to make sure that we have black faculty and staff and Latino faculty and staff, so that we have a global village in the classroom so that students leave there having heard different opinions and perspectives from all over the globe and from, from many different races, because we want our students to leave being global citizens, armed with perspectives and, 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 and views and visions for communities that are beyond their own monolithic kind of approach that they may have walked onto the campus with. So my job is to make impact, whether it's in hiring, <laughs> whether it's in um, programmatic opportunities, tenure and promotion of faculty and staff. It's, it's the entire campus. It's every aspect, it's athletics. It's making sure that women have opportunities and, and gen, we don't have gender bias on how to set up programs in athletics. You know, so it's a multi-contextual approach. It's a big job. And, and also that we have gender equity as it relates to um, hiring and promotion and, and, and also income and revenue. You know, so, um, you know, the president had a vision that it would have tentacles in every aspect of the institution. 
Lisa, I'd love to speak to your question about systemic racism. If Absolutely, go ahead. Okay. So um, we've been offering um, a series to the community um, to just introduce uh, systemic racism and what it means and why it exists. And one of the analogies that's used is so great. Um, it's called groundwater and it, and it goes like this. If you live uh, near a lake and you see a fish floating in the water, you're likely to look at that fish and think, hmm, I wonder what happened to that fish. It wasn't healthy. But if you saw the same lake with thousands of fish floating at the surface, you would probably ask yourself, what's wrong with the water? And if that lake existed near other lakes and all of those lakes had thousands of fish floating at the top of the water, you'd probably ask yourself, what's going on with the groundwater? Because obviously groundwater feeds all of the lakes um, on the planet. So we really introduced that analogy and talk about the lakes as different systems. So whether it's education or health or housing, what you see in all of those systems is people of color not surviving the systems. Uh, so rather than addressing the fish, we need to address the water. And that's how we're talking about systemic racism as just a way to think um, a little bit more differently about it. I like that, that's awesome. Yeah. So, and then also, I know Christopher at the Freedom Center. You guys have is the is the implicit bias a a, a permanent exhibit there at the Freedom Center, and how how has that been useful um, for people helping them to identify um, what some of their attitudes are? Um, yes, we have. It's, it's it's actually not an exhibit. It is actually a learning lab. Um, as we term it, um, open your mind. Uh, and um, we just reopened it um, with restrictions, of course, with the pandemic of how many uh, can be in that capacity. Um, but it's used as a way to um, give scientific information of about how the brain works, um, as well as what keeps those barriers to making quick um, shortcut decisions where people will prejudge uh, and just come to assumptions and conclusions um, often and a lot of times based on race. Um, but I would like to also um, address a little bit of your original question um, when we talk about systemic racism um, and how it relates to our institution as well. Um, you know, the, the original system of, racist, of racism, systemic racism, is enslavement that existed in this country. Um, in 1837, a black abolitionist and minister by the name of Joshua Easton said some very powerful words and is very relevant today. Um, he states that abolition may attack slaveholding, uh, but there's a danger still that the spirit of slavery will survive in the form of prejudice after the system is overturned. Our warfare ought not to be against slavery alone, but against the spirit which marks color a mark of degradation. And so in 1837, in the infancy stages uh, of this country, he is talking about um, this level of this spirit of, of slavery existing, a spirit related to race. And he was very accurate in that. Um, there's, you can't, it's very, it's very rare to find a decade where black folks were not justice inequality in this country. Although we talk about what's going on currently in 2020, but it's the same outrage that existed uh, during coming in 2001 in the city where we uh, had uh, civil unrest. Uh, it happened during the 90s with the Rodney King um, beaten by police. And you can go back to the, the 70s, the 60s, the 50s, uh, during the era that which caused the nadir of race relations where you had rampant uh, common lynchings of black bodies and black lives. And so, this has been ongoing, and people who are, have been in the struggle were exhausted, were tired, um, and it's the understanding that this has been so woven into the fabric and culture of our country, race has been, but we choose not to have the conversation because it's uncomfortable, but it has always been there. 
So how do we start that conversation? And Dr. Shaheed, you've talked about the need for healing because mm -hmm. we have these repeated episodes where basically the scab keeps getting ripped off of, mm -hmm. of uh, racism here in our country. And there just doesn't seem to be a lot of, of speaking um, and concentration on how communities and how the country can heal. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think you're absolutely right, Lisa, and, and Chris is right. Um, and I think that that spirit um, is something that we never go after. Uh, and so part of what I've been hoping to posit into this conversation and to deposit you know, into our students that we serve at Xavier is an understanding of the need um, to not ignore racial wounding and what that does and how that impacts our capacity to experience the fullness of our humanity. It's not enough to just say, oh my gosh, police brutality is bad and we should make sure it doesn't happen again. We've got to address what the brutality has done to those who remain living um, and how that impacts the way they experience all areas of human activity. Um, there's so much trauma um, that has never been addressed uh, and not just in the lives of black folk, but in the lives of white folk. Um, I use a, an analogy or I ask a question you know, of folks. Um, when you look at someone who is experiencing a beating, you got to think about or ask yourself the question, um, who's having, who's really being wounded? Is it the person who is receiving the beating? Is it the person who's beating the, the other human being? Or is it the person who's watching it happen? Um, and so often we only focus on one aspect um, of that experience, um, even as we talk about ways to address anti-racism. Um, and there's a lot of wounding, there's a lot of trauma there's a lot of emotional and psychological and economic um, trauma that has happened that has to be addressed. Um, otherwise, that spirit is never fully addressed and it finds a way um, to, to re-earth itself, right? So what was slavery became sharecropping, became, 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 became and it becomes, become, becomes, um, even as there are people who are saying, well, I'm not racist, um, that spirit is still alive. And so without, um, being clear about needing to address uh, the trauma, you know, that associate itself with, you know, our activities, we find ourselves right back where we started, um, you know, and so what we're seeing today in 2020 is no different than what you would have seen on a plantation hundreds of years ago, um, where perhaps using different language, we're in different clothing, uh, but that thick um, position between the oppressor and the oppressed um, has not shifted. We're still doing the same dance. I think that is so uh, powerful, what you just said. And um, it was making me think of, um, we did a screening of I Am Not Your Negro. It was actually at the Freedom Center and Aisha Kareva Smart came and she's the niece of James Baldwin and it's his movie. And when we had a debrief after watching the movie, which was very intense, you know, she reminded us that trauma not treated is transferred. Mm -hmm. The generation after generation, the trauma that's never been addressed is just embedded in those who um, are born and raised. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not been very long. Mm -hmm. Not been very long. So. You know, I think sometimes whites in particular uh, get hung up on this notion that, you know, my family didn't own slaves. And so why are you holding me accountable? And it's like, well, you're not being held accountable for that, but you do have some responsibility to help to address those wounds that, that have been around for hundreds of years. Uh, somebody on, on LinkedIn posted, I thought, you know, a really great article where he was using the analogy of if, if somebody abandons a baby on my doorstep, it's like, it's not my fault that they did that, but I have a responsibility. Because if I don't go there and deal with that baby that's on my doorstep, then I'm culpable too. And so I thought that distinguishing between fault versus responsibility is part of the conversation that we need to be having. Absolutely. So and I think also beyond that, though, because I, I find so often people use that argument that you just shared, Patricia, right? Well, my family didn't own slaves, um, you know, and so I'm not, you know, part of this. I haven't been actively participating 
in this anti-racist society. And that's not true. There's not a person alive right now who hasn't contributed to this white supremacist society, right? And so we've got to think about not just the trauma from 100 years ago, but the trauma, you know, from 20 and 50 years ago. Somebody participated and is responsible in redlining. Right. Mm -hmm. Somebody participated and is responsible and has never been held accountable for the hundreds of massacres that have taken place in metropolitan cities over the past few decades. Right. Somebody's responsible for Tulsa and was never held accountable. Somebody's responsible for Wilmington and was never held accountable. Somebody's responsible for gentrification and OTR is not being held accountable. Um, and so I think we've got to think about um, accountability um, in a different way of we're not looking at fault, but right, but we're also looking at how do you address the actual wound without saying, well, the wound exists, my bad, kind of maybe, but not really, and maybe let's just move on from it, but we're not going to recover, right, we're not going to restore, we're just going to put, you know, a blanket over it, um, and I think it's, it's time out for that type of, um, I, I think, misguided, theoretical, you know, sort of perspective on well, we need to move forward and justice looks like us forgetting or justice looks like us forgiving without us actually addressing uh, and reconciling um, where the wound is. Um, so I can't say enough how important that is for all communities to be able to heal. Right. Who are contem continually um, disenfranchised with those who are disenfranchising, right? So that they can also move from that fixed position without a sense of guilt or a need to repeat um, the tradition because that's all we know how to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it goes back to a little bit of, you know, the initial discussion of Princeton admitting um, that they did have systemic racism. And so, you know, what does that process look like? I mean, what should we be seeing here in the Cincinnati community in terms of activities and conversations and, and things that can help um, help heal and, and also help people understand that, you know, this is a diverse community of people and that they should all be included in all levels. I believe the first step is truth. Truth and honesty about how we got to where we are and where we are um, trying to go. Um, it comes down to truth. The, the reality of it is that um, people have accepted a false narrative when it comes to race. Um, they ex accepted um, untruths uh, in, in some type of mythology about race. Um, the fact of the matter is uh, we have the progress we have today because of the four million um, people uh, men, women, and children who were emancipated uh, at the end of the Civil War. Um, we've all benefited from uh, their hard labor, those ancestors that worked into the field. Um, when we talk about um, housing, when we talk about economics, um, you know, we often, we talk about, um, when we talk about enslavement, that the cotton produced uh, in the South in this country uh, provided 60% of the world's cotton. Uh, and so think about that wealth uh, gap that has been um, manipulated and, and exists. Um, so I think we need to been, uh, begin with truth and to have honest conversations and then talk about what policies can be put in place to eradicate um, the systems uh, of racism that have manifested itself here in the 21st century. And, and I also think we need to really revisit how we talk about inclusion. You know, um, I, I get really frustrated when people say, well, we, it's really inclusive. We had two black folks, we had two Latinos, we had an Asian representative, um, and, 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 but the way we go about engaging them and the way in which we invite them to the, to the table um, is oftentimes extremely patriarchal. And so for me, inclusion is not how many people you have at the table or whether or not you listen to them when they spoke or, or, or whether or not you're gonna invite them back. Inclusion for me is shared power. Inclusion for me is shared decision-making. You know, um, I, I get frustrated people say, well, it was a really inclusive conversation. We would invite a lot of people to get their opinions and you invited me in there to give my opinion. You invite me in to testify. 
but you don't let me stay to adjudicate. You don't let me stay there to make the decision. I'm invited to be part of the discourse, but not the planning or the implementation, right? And so inclusion is shared power. Inclusion is shared participation. Inclusion is shared decision making. I mean, and, and I, I just think that we have, you know, this, this idea that representation is inclusion and it is not. You know, it's, a, it's about everyone having equal power in the process. Dale, yeah. um, thank you for bringing that up because Patricia, you have done a lot of research and you have a whole um, study on what you call the illusion of inclusion. Can mm -hmm. you talk about what that is and, and how what your research has found? Yeah, I started doing that in the early 90s. So it was, you know, literally about 20 years since affirmative action began. So we're beginning to see some women and people of color moving up into, you know, director level, maybe vice president level positions. And then I started hearing some stories from some of our clients that indicated that uh, there was some confusion on the part of some people, certainly not all of them, who had had moved up the ladder a bit. And so I went out and did a lot of interviews, white men, white women, men of color, women of color, and, and was really trying to find out, you know, what are the signals that let you know that you're really included in that inner circle of power and influence? And, you know, do you get the signals and do you know how to read them? And so that's where this journey began for me. And, and so totally agree with what Daryl said, just because you're hired doesn't mean you're included. And I think that's one of the illusions that corporate executives have had for a long time. Well, we hired this person and we gave this person that job. And, and that doesn't mean you're really included. And, and, you know, the more recent studies that I've done uh, have shown that, that men of color, who most of them in the study have been black men, are statistically less included in mm -hmm. five out of 10 key interaction networks. So we ask who questions and people click on names. And, and what we see is, uh, there are times when they're not including themselves as much as they could, which is what we call protective hesitation. You know, I don't reach out, I don't ask as many questions because if I ask too many questions, is somebody going to um, think that I don't know what I'm talking about? There will be that differential consequence if you ask too many questions and, and that others don't seek them out often. And I think that's the unconscious bias. You know, one of the questions is, who do you go to for help in solving a problem or to think through a decision that you need to make? So for men of color, they don't seek others out as much because I think they're worried about how they'll be stereotyped if they do that. And others don't reach out to them as much, which I think is that bias that says, well, why would I go to Christopher? He doesn't know anything I don't know. You know? So it's, it's the double whammy that's happening on both sides. So, you know, I think, I think Blacks grow up hearing you're going to have to work twice as hard. And what the data shows is, and you also have to work twice as hard at building relationships. And I think that speaks to the, the standards, right? The standards um, consistently have been different um, for people of color. Um, you're absolutely right. I was told that uh, from the outset growing up, and it stayed, has stayed with me uh, to this very day that, I must work twice as hard, no, twice as much to get half as much. Um, I'm often confused with uh, having a doctorate degree. Um, I just, you know, I have a master's in public history. Um, but a lot of that comes from the fact that I've done a lot of research and I've done a lot of studying um, to where I have colleagues who do have doctorate degrees and they tell me, well, you know, just as much or more than, than I do. Um, and so, um, but I've made the decision to, at this standpoint, unless it's uh, feasible <laughs> to where I won't, I'm not planning on getting that PhD, but it's the knowledge I, that I feel that I have to obtain and constantly learn, learn, and learn so that I know as much as I know as, as, as much as possible so that I can be successful in my field. And many of my colleagues feel the same way um, when you look across you know, to other races to where 
um, there's an amount of privilege to where uh, they don't necessarily have to work as hard. They don't have to put as much input in, but yet they still get the same benefits as someone who is working twice as hard. So how do we um, balance that out? Um, you know, and having that understanding. Um, and so there's development on both sides of that. Um, and me having the understanding or, or black people having the understanding that that is not normal. That should not be, we should not be satisfied with that analogy to working twice as hard. Um, no one in the society should be, that you should be more equitable. I often say that we've moved from the era of searching for equality into an era of equity. Um, and because of all the systemic racism that has built up over time, um, that's what we need to have our focus. So when you talk about inclusion, you have to talk about that equity portion as well. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, too, Chris, uh, Lisa, we've got to be talking about the, the notion that reparation has to mean full repair. And yes, I did use the word reparation, which makes a lot of people nervous because we need to talk about it. We need to talk about repair um, in the sense of not just changing how people see who needs to work harder or who works, but who controls the narrative around design, deciding that in the first place, right? Like who's getting to name what black people should do or how they respond, um, right? Who gets to determine what my experience is, um, is also part of the repair that needs to happen, right? Um, it's not just about having the freedom to show up, but to be able to decide how and when you show up. Um, it is not just about having the freedom to learn more, um, but having the capacity to decide what it is that you are learning or unlearning. Um, white, uh, white supremacist thinking has been in control of not just economics and the way we move about this earth, but also what we learn and what we consider to be knowledge and worthy of study um, and what we consider to be um, value added when we come into these institutions and places of work, right? And so my PhD signals for people in some way, right, that I have a capacity to understand and participate in a way that's not signaled by my being Black and female. But the truth of the matter is my being Black and female is more often than not the educational resource that I pull from that people would associate with what I learned from Miami University um, when I studied for my doctorate. And that's not true, right? And so part of my research is also about undoing the epistemic violence um, that makes us think that what we learn in these spaces, what we learn from white institutions, what we learn at white supremacist organizations and corporations is the knowledge that we must protect and have access to to move forward. Um, and that's absolutely not true. There's some healing needed there as well. I really agree with Kyra, and Kyra's done some amazing work in, in, in healing um, uh, African-American students, you know, from the trauma that, that we've experienced, not just in our lifetimes, but what, what we've inherited. But I, I want to talk about it in a different way for a second. And that is my frustration with these conversations around healing community. Because when I, when I hear people talk about it, I think when they talk about they want to heal the community, they want the protests to stop. They, they want us to stop talking about and, and, and being angry about the death of George Floyd and, and, and Breonna Taylor. But that is not healing. That's a cessation of, 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 of protest. That is the end of, of public you know, trauma and, and, and anger being shown in the streets. But to really get to community healing, we have to have some justice in around some of those situations that occurred and then some change and some, and some modifications to access and some and 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 opportunity, and even the narrative that Kyra was talking about that 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 defines you know people of color um, without them being a participant in in writing the definition, you know, or or how they want to be seen or what they want. It becomes very patriarchal after protests and after violence in the streets. People all of a sudden run to give you things that that you they think you want to have, but they don't ask you what it is that you need, and it shows up in higher education. I had some students say to me the other day that you know they weren't excited about participating in, in a couple of different programs because folks have decided that they were going to just have these programs and, and they never talked to the students. You know, they didn't invite them into the relationship. And, and, and uh, Kyra and I were talking about it the other day. 
about you know people wanting these transactional relationships but they don't have the foundational relationship in the beginning and so it goes with these with when we have with riots in the streets we have we have protests and we have an incident that occurs there's never really any community healing healing it's really about how do we get you to stop how do we get things back to our level of normalcy but the change in the community where all of the pain the anger and the trauma resonated from that that is a reaction to yet another court event is never dealt with you know i mean the counselors are never sent in the healing never begins we just kind of we just kind of wrap our arms around it as yet another experiential tragedy you know that that that, that we tell our children about how don't do this in order to survive kind of a thing right and so I really want to talk about community healing in a different way. It has to have justice, it's got to have equity, and it's got to have inclusion in order for it to be community healing. And then on top of that, you know, at some point we need to be able to validate each other's stories. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, because it's all wrapped up in a narrative that's not mine. When I read about incidents that happen with, 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 with um, King out in California, or even Philando Castillo, I lived in Minnesota when it happened. I was there in the, in the city the day it occurred. The stories that I read now are not congruent with the experience I had the day he was killed. So, you know, I mean, it's really, you know, celebrating and, and, and really appreciating each other's stories and giving them validity. That's the only way we're going to start to heal. Because when we come back and you tell a whole other story from what I experienced, I no longer trust you. Right. Because you've changed the narrative. And when that don't heal me. That increases my distrust. So, you know, I'm going to go around the horn here, (laughs) so to speak, and um, just ask everyone to maybe comment on where do you think this healing should begin and what do you think that your particular organization can do or is doing to start that healing process? Um, Patricia, maybe would you like to start? Yeah, I... You know, I think a lot of people and organizations are wanting to to have dialogue and have conversation, but I think we need to make sure that we create a safe place. We had a client who wanted to right away, we want to do small group discussions and bring people together in our organization. And I said, you know, right now, I mean, this was when everything was just happening. I said, you know, black people have their families and their friends and their support network. I don't know, I can't say that they're ready to sit down with our white coworkers and talk about this stuff right now. So we ended up doing a a big focus group for their company and and asked that question. It's all anonymous, everybody's just typing their answers. And you know, like 82% of the whites said, yes, we should have these small group discussions. And about 60% of the blacks said, well, yeah, maybe, but. You know, I've tried having those conversations about race before and I was branded and I was labeled. I was retaliated against. So how how are you going to make sure that that I can have this conversation now and that it, it will be safe and I won't pay the consequences anymore? So I think, yes, we have to have conversation. We have to have dialogue, but we need to also make sure that, that people aren't going to pay a price for being honest. Okay, uh, Ellen? Um, Lisa, I, I think your question is a challenging one, um, and it's challenging for me. I mean, I'm a white woman. I don't have a black experience, uh, so I um, am just conscious and mindful of uh, taking my lead from others. Uh, that said, like one of the things that um, really has been resonating uh, for me and my organization kind of goes back to what Christopher was saying about truth, that we're trying to begin uh, the dialogue around racial equity and how to get there with truth. And that comes from history, just learning our history in a way that is not whitewashed, um, that just speaks the truth of what has happened in our nation. And we have found that people who have engaged in these conversations just can see uh, the dynamics of structural racism in very different ways, can understand how or can see that uh, disparities exist in every sector of our lives and are persistent regardless of socioeconomic status. Um, And then the telling of history helps us understand 
where it began and how it was perpetuated 1619 until today. Um, so I think in order to get people to a place where they can talk and just own the truth of circumstances, that um, history is a really good place to start. All right. Sorry, uh, Christopher. So um, at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, we have been, um, since we opened our doors in 2004, uh, we've been a convener of dialogue, of conversation um, to address these uncomfortable issues. Uh, and we continue to do so. Um, and so for us, it's pivoting uh, into a virtual direction. Uh, for those conversations, but it cannot only be conversations. It has to be a conversation that leads to action, that leads to change. Uh, and so we can't have um, dialogue without the work. The work is needed to be done. And so one of the things is we want to encourage people to do the work, uh, to be agents of change, to be modern day abolitionists today. When we talk about mass incarceration and how the criminal justice system has been replaced with the system of enslavement uh, that existed. And so we wanna encourage people to be more knowledgeable about our country and about race relations. So, uh, you know, I would say a couple things that anyone can do if they never read this. Read David Walker's Appeal, which you can find electronically. Um, it was the first piece of document to challenge the Constitution, to challenge the morality and principles of this country around the issue of race. David Walker's Appeal. Um, uh, read Roger B. Taney's um, decision uh, about race in the Dred Scott decision case and how that laid seeds for these ideas of white supremacy in this country. And then um, to bring up to date, um, Just Mercy, Brian Stevenson and the work that he's done with the Equal Justice Initiative. And a lot of that work is steeped in the history um, that has led us to where we are right here in 2020. And so if you don't want to either see the movie, read the book, um, uh, Slavery by Another Name is a wonderful documentary as well to get this information of, wow, how did this system become so entrenched into our country? Because once you are powered with that knowledge, then you're able to find solutions to bring about change. And we need to have people of power and influence to be exposed to these stories so that they can use their power and influence for the good of all. All right, uh, Dr. Shahid. Woo, deep breath. Um, so for me, I think there's, there are a few things, right? Like you asked the question about where should the healing begin? And I think healing has to begin for everybody exactly where you are. Um, Dr. Joy DeGroy um, wrote a book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, and I've used it in my um, class over the years. Um, and there's, example, there's an example that she uses that I use in my class. Um, and I pull up a photo of an African-American man who has been lynched. Um, his body um, has been set on fire. Uh, and I pull the photo up and I ask folks to tell me what it is that they see. Um, and more often than not, every single year, what they see is the lynched man hanging. What they fail to see is the family of white folks who are posed, who are dressed um, around the body. Uh, and there's a young, really young girl um, who's about five or six years old who's standing in front, right? And so I asked them, what about her? Um, and so when we're talking about healing, so often people focus on, well, we need to focus on that black family and what we can do to help that and find out what that is. Maybe we could build a monument or maybe we could say we're sorry. And I'm not trying to say that those things are not important or to make light of that. But what I'm saying is well, when we're talking about addressing racial healing and the wounding, we've got to address the, he the healing and wounding that we all possess. Uh, and know that you've got to start with self and start with your own community before you can heal someone else's. Um, and so particularly at Xavier, you know, we have so many students who are coming forward and they want to know rightfully so, right? Like, what can I do to get involved? How can I make a difference? I'm not black. I don't have a black experience. And I'm going, what does that have to do with racial trauma? Because black folks don't own racism. And guess what? We can't fix it. 
So you start with your community, you start with your family, you start with your corporation, you start with your neighborhood, no matter how you show up, whether you are black or white or Indian, however it is you're taking space up in this country, you start with your own because racism impacts all areas of human activity in all communities. Um, and so part of the trauma that black folks experience is not only us trying to figure out how do we survive and thrive in this country, but also how do we help to educate and push forward for a sense of morality for all people beyond ourselves. And that's a burden, that's a load that we cannot continue to carry. Um, it is too much to ask of black folks, what should we do? Um, I think we all have to be participating in answering that question um, so that the healing takes place and it's everybody's responsibility. Everybody's at work. Um, so that when I walk into a space, my white colleagues um, who would like to be allies or accomplices um, have done their work before I come in, right? And so that as I am trying to heal trauma in my own black community, in my own family, um, that I have the space and capacity to do so. I think that is significant. I think that that is important. I think that so often um, as institutions are putting forth anti-racist actions, we forget the healing that's needed in communities that are not black and how that impacts the black community that we say we want to heal. Um, at Xavier right now, uh, you know, I'm uh, uh, part of the work to help us reconcile our historical connections to slavery and help us see the truth of who we are um, and who the Jesuits were, who the Catholic Church is, how our faith has played a role um, in justifying uh, the dehumanization of other people. Uh, and it'd be easy to say, you know, as an institution of higher education, we want to help Cincinnati or we want to help. Or we want to look at what happened with George Floyd and we want to help his family, um, not, recognize, not recognizing our own work that needs to be done. Um, so I can't say enough how important it is to start exactly where you are. Um, and from there, it becomes very clear how you help others. Um, and other ways that we talk about healing and restoration for the body and for the mind and spirit. You know that once you take that beam out of your own eye, it is easier for you to see and understand how you help others. So much so you won't even need to ask them what's needed. You'll know intuitively. Um, and that's the work that's got to happen. I, I just want to say thank you, Kyra. <laughs> I just want to say thank you, Kyra. I mean, you know, the, the reality is, you know, I, I don't think so many of us have the capacity to get to the place that, that Kyra was talking about without direction and coaching. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and she provides that direction and coaching. And I will say this too, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about. One of God's greatest blessings to me is whenever one of my students become my teacher. I just love it. <laughs> 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 but no, I mean, I just, I just, I just really believe that the, the things that Kyra is talking about are so real. And, and, and it's hard for us to put it into words oftentimes when you're in the leadership and you're a person of color and then people come to you and say, well, what do we do now? You're the chief diversity officer. How do we fix it? You know, um, and it is sometimes way too much responsibility to put on the backs of individuals who are also traumatized. You know, because I'll be honest with you, when when I watched that that uh, George Floyd die on the on the ground um, outside that store, um, I was as traumatized as my 14 year old son. When when I watched and listened to what happened to Breonna Taylor, I was broken up as much as any of my students on campus. And yet I still have to go to work, manage that work, deal with the realities that I've watched yet another black man be murdered on the street. You know, and for me, because of my age and tenure, um, this isn't my first or my 15th, you know? And so the, the trauma is real. And so when you come to work and then people say, so, so what do we do? The first reaction I want to say is stop killing black men. But um, <laughs> that's not the appropriate response. You know, you have to come up with something strategic. You have to come up with something methodical and intentional to help the campus and the community heal. And it's not always easy. And, and sometimes you're like, you know, I'm not sure that I want to do that today. Yeah, Kyra, what you just said was so powerful uh, and empowering, really. Yeah, mic drop, it was so awesome. And um, it was making me think of uh, another fish story, uh, like this uh, illustration that's kind of been going around of, um, two fish in a bowl and there's a black fish and a white fish and the black fish is saying man it's like hard to swim in this water and the white fish is like what water and um it it's taken us on a little bit of a journey at gcf in terms of uh looking at our culture and um how you know a white supremacist 
orientation gets embedded into cultures. You can't even feel it. You can't even see it. Um, and how we go about addressing issues may be embedded in um, white ways. Uh, so I think it just creates a, a tremendous amount of complexity and the starting from right where you are is such an awesome way to, to think about how to step into this work and have conversations and um, you know, I know Eddie Cohn from the Urban League is always saying like, just don't, don't go for perfection, just, just go, right? Um, and it was really great what you said, thank you. Yeah, there are so many really good things that are out there today um, on YouTube and TED Talks. I mean, there's just no reason not to educate yourself. Uh, you know, and people are sharing a lot of that information. One that I hadn't heard of was Holy Post, which walks through the whole history of privilege and, and racism and institutionalized racism in this country. And, you know, Reconstructing White Privilege by Robin DiAngelo. I mean, it's 22 minutes. It's, it's just one of the best ways I've ever heard white privilege articulated. So there's just no excuse, really, to not educate yourself. Well, all right, um, everybody, I think that this has been a very um, enlightening conversation. And I really thank all of you for taking your time out of your, your day um, to share with us um, really, really good, strong information. Like I said in the email, you are all subject matter experts and you certainly proved it here today.